Hello, and welcome to Armory Live. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce our next panel discussion, Big Brother Builds Collections, Data's, transformation, Data's Transformative Impact on the Art Market. Moderator Tim Schneider, art business editor at Art News, speaks to three insiders for their thoughts on data collection and its impact on discovery and on the collecting process. We welcome Serena Moody, Art Logic, Director of the Americas, Dustin Kim from Artsy, Chief Revenue Officer, and Bettina Huang, General Manager and Head of Platform. New for this year, our Armory Live program is streaming live, so I'd also like to welcome our online viewers. We will have a very brief question and answer at the end of the hour, during which we'll field questions both from the room and online. So please feel free to send your questions throughout the session so that we can get to all of them at the end. Without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Tim, and thank you all very, very much for joining us here at the Armory Show this year. Thanks, Eliza. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us on a Sunday afternoon. Before we get into the actual panel discussion, I just want to set the stage a little bit. So back in the fall of 2019, I wrote a story for Artnet that was time to the company's 30th anniversary. And the idea was for me to go out and try to figure out what some of the most significant structural shifts in the art world over those 30 years were. And one of them that emerged very quickly was just this huge increase in the amount of and access to art market data. And just as a reference point, I, for that story, I talked to Cheyenne Westfall, who's the chair of Phillips, and she told me that back in 1990, when she started her auction career at Sotheby's, the way that Sotheby's was keeping track of their auction prices was that after every sale, an assistant would go into the physical auction catalog with a pair of scissors, and they would cut out the entry for each lot handwrite the price on it, glue it onto an index card, and then file it into this massive internal card catalog system. Now, this was helpful, but maybe not that helpful in the grand scheme of things. But if we fast forward to today, it's basically impossible to get through even a day of art world news without being confronted by some type of art market data. And that can range from historical analyses of auction prices, to in the moment art fair sales reports, to wider reaching studies of say, gender or racial inequity in the art world. There are about six other, I'm sorry, about six million other examples I could point to here. And some of them are free of charge, some of them you are being asked to pay for, and oftentimes the price is not cheap. So in the midst of all this, it's understandable that some people react to what I'll call the quantitative revolution in the art market by just saying, you know what, this is overwhelming. It's not what I came here for. I'm not interested in it. I'm just going to tune it out. At the same time, there are also people on the other end who just love it, cannot get enough of it, but who maybe aren't engaging with it as critically as they should. And from my own experience, what I can say is that I think that the optimal way to deal with art market data is to acknowledge that some of it can in fact be really, really helpful and can be transformative as the title of this talk implies, but that in order to get there, you have to be willing to ask these second order questions about things like, well, where is this data coming from? Who's collecting it? Why are they interested in giving it to me? And is what they're quantifying even important in the first place? These are not necessarily easy questions to ask. And then over top of all that, there's this much, much larger discussion about how the quantitative revolution in the art market is changing things even for the people who are personally like, you know what, I don't want to deal with this. And thankfully, there are three people on the stage who are much smarter than me who can help us answer some of these questions. So with that as our little transition point, I want to move over into turning the floor over to Bettina, to Dustin, to Serena. So let's start here. When I talk to people in the art world about data, I tend to hear two conflicting narratives. And on the one hand, I will have people tell me, there's so much data out there, I don't know how to deal with it, it's just overwhelming. On the other hand, I will also have other people tell me, you know what, 
the art market is trying with this data stuff, but when I look at other industries, we are so embarrassingly behind where everyone else is that I'm not even sure what to say about it. So here's my question. Which of those two narratives do you think we are closer to being true on right now? And why do you think so? And Bettina, I will start with you just because you are unfortunately, for your sake, the first person to my left. Um, no, it's not unfortunate at all. Um, I, I think that the art industry is, I mean, I, I see it as being um, fairly, yeah, as, as being pretty behind. So I think the, the latter of your two narratives. Um, I was actually looking at this visualization a few weeks ago. I can't remember where it was from, to be honest, but it was uh, showing over time various industries and their kind of consumption of data on consumers. And so 15 years ago, uh, I was focused on the e-commerce industry and the 15 years ago, the e-commerce industry was consuming a very small, call it like 6% of the whole pie of data, if there is a whole pie one, whereas like financial services was, was massive. And over time, that has shifted such that it's one of the you know, largest consumers of data. And so I think that we're actually much closer to that 15 years ago point. Um, and in fact, I, my first job in e-commerce was about 10 years ago. And, and so it doesn't actually feel that far from where we were 10 years ago in e-commerce outside of art. Got it. And Dustin, how about you? I'm imagining you all can guess where I stand on this, given, given where I work and Artsy's mission to um, unlock the art market. I think we're making great progress, uh, but I definitely think we have a long, long way to go. Uh, the art world is known to be opaque. We're the last you know, major consumer industry to move online. And as a result, you know, while, while we are starting to see more data, more transparency, more sharing of information, more ease of, of purchasing online, I think we're only kind of at the, the tip of the spear in terms of what can ultimately be done. Serena? Yeah, no, I would agree with that, with, um, with Dustin. And I think it's interesting, we're not at either end of the spectrum in terms of these polar opposites. We're kind of doing this interesting slow dance where one person or one partner is a bit out of step. You know, it's like, if we look pre-COVID, cloud computing, galleries actually using cloud computing was terrifying for a lot of people, putting their data online. And then you look to COVID and everyone's just going online and they're really embracing these digital strategies. But then you see kind of the boom of NFTs and I try to compare that against how long it took a gallery to implement an iPad in their sales team. And you see those trajectories and they're completely different. So I feel like we're just trying to, we're gonna have to try to resolve that tension between the two of them. We're not there yet, um, but it's definitely part of the narrative I think that we're walking into right now. Right. Can I add one thing, which I Please. think kind of piggybacks off of what you were saying, Serena, but I also think that there is a conception in the art world, not, you know, this is not universal, but there are some people who think that rather than kind of building the right foundations of using data, we should try to kind of skip and do something that I think like is, you know, as sophisticated as you might see in other industries that have a longer track record and I think more, um, just stronger knowledge um, fundamentally. And I just don't, I think that there's a lot of work that we have to do before we can kind of make that leap. Well, that actually leads into another question I wanted to ask, which is, if we're gonna make this comparison between where the art market or the art world is in terms of its use of data and other industries, what can we learn from those other industries? Like, what, what lessons are out there that maybe people who are just used to coming up in a specific art context aren't thinking about that can maybe move this along further towards that endpoint where we are working in a sophisticated way, data. Dustin, you are nodding enthusiastically, so I'm going to go to you. Yeah, I mean, I would start with, I guess I'd say two things. First, listen to your customers. And this isn't just, you know, this is just, I guess, a, a fundamental rule. But part of the move to online embracing data is meeting collectors where they're at, particularly newer, younger collectors. They expect basic information. They expect to be able to find the price of a work. They expect to be able to read all sorts of information about an artist's background and his or her, you know, 
sales uh, history, career trajectory. It's just table stakes nowadays. So I think, you know, the industry needs to recognize that and deliver if we want to ultimately grow the art market and want to, you know, invite more of these younger collectors into the mix because that is the future, you know, of, of, of collectors. Um, so I'd just say kind of meeting your customers where they're at is one. And then the second thing I'd say is, you know, I consistently hear about this tension or feel this tension sometimes that there is a, a risk or a threat that online displaces in person or offline experiences. And I don't think that's true. I don't think we've seen that in, you know, several other luxury industries, whether or not it's home buying or car buying or jewelry buying. Um, you can get great discovery information online and then you can still fall in love with something in person. You could stand in front of an amazing piece of, of artwork but have done all of your research online beforehand and want to actually complete the purchase using your cell phone standing right there in front of this work. So, you know, the second lesson I think for me is just these two are actually wonderful complements to one another, and it doesn't have to be that you know online is displacing uh, some of the more traditional in-person aspects of our industry. Right, Serena. Since you and since your company and Artsy kind of work together, sort of hand in glove on some of this kinds of stuff, I'm just wondering if there's anything you want to add to that in any kind of I way. I totally agree with Dustin. No, gotcha. there you go. <laughs> no but I do. And in terms of, um, I mean, like we said, the art world is a bit behind a lot of other industries and other sectors. So with that, there's an advantage. Sit, sit back and watch what they're doing and learn from their mistakes. I mean, if we look at publishing, even fashion advertising, they had to put everything online um, and get away from print. And they realized that content was king. And I think we're only starting to realize that. We're opening up the narratives. We're contextualizing artwork. And we're putting that data and information online to a larger audience now. One of the things that you mentioned in your answer, Dustin, was this idea of sort of uh, the in-person experience and the online experience being at odds with one another. And that, to me, speaks to one of these other tensions that I think comes up when we talk about data, which is that, especially from people who have been in the art world for much longer, it's not unusual for me to hear them say, well, part of the reason I don't want to get into all this data stuff is because it just reduces everything to a number. It makes it all based on quantity or price or whatever we can sort of distill something down to. And I don't like how that feels. That is, that is antithetical to the, my experience of art as this sort of full-blooded uh, living thing out there in the world. So I'm curious if you can give us some kind of insight as to like, how do we avoid just using data to turn the art world into this kind of cold, rote, in the worst case scenario, like soullessly corporate thing? I think, I mean, it, it starts with correcting that misperception. Data is not kind of an all or nothing proposition where either you don't use it or like you only use it. Um, and I do think that companies that rely too heavily on data do end up creating experiences that can lack some soul and lack some of the spontaneity that makes art really beautiful. So, but I think it's really important just to think of data as a tool to make really informed decisions. And, uh, and you can look at the data and then decide to do actually exactly what the, you know, what the trend is. Um, but that is a much more conscious and intentional than decision. Um, so I think you don't have to lose the spontaneity. It's just really about understanding the context in which you're operating, understanding your customers, to Dustin's point, and being able to create experiences and art from there. Right. Um, Serena, in terms of, of what you do at Art Logic, the idea that you're sort of creating this hybridized thing where it's an inventory management system, but it also feeds into these larger structures, whether it's your website or uh, your mailing list or whatever else. Um, just going off of Bettina's idea of like data as a tool to do other things, can you maybe talk a little bit about how uh, you've seen data drive decisions for maybe some of your clients, um, in, maybe in ways that they wouldn't have anticipated or that they might not otherwise have done? 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think also going back to that other industries, looking at the retail market, similar with galleries, I mean, because of COVID and lockdown, a lot of brick and mortars had to close down and they really had to think about, okay, well, how do we engage with our clients? How do we keep those everlasting relationships healthy and stable? And they started actually looking at data. And I think we started to notice that across our clientele, that people were actually analyzing the information that they've always had, the information that they've collected and amassed, but not analytically enough or with the proper intention, like Bettina mentioned. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of drive towards that, which I think is really important. But just like Bettina said, it's about data should inform, it shouldn't dictate. So it should really assist you in thinking about things, but you actually have to have a conscious behind it as well and looking at it through a human lens. Can I just add to that too, that there are so many wonderful uh, tools like viewing rooms um, that can be added to the data so that the discovery process online is still a rich and wonderful discovery process. It's not that, I think sometimes there's a fear that if I put a piece of art online and I put the price up and I just put the data up, then it's, it feels too much like I just commoditized it and it's this like grossly commercial Amazon-like experience. But, you know, the art world has so much creativity behind it and the people that are, you know, passionate about art are the people creating the content uh, that is being presented online. So, you know, galleries are creating these wonderful viewing rooms or videos that go along with the basic information that I think, you know, differentiates your sort of like standard e-commerce type of presentation of data information in the thing and then clicking of a button. And this is kind of a, a tangent to that, but I mean, Patina, since platform is a click to buy marketplace, I mean, I have to imagine that you have dealt with some fears from galleries that you're highlighting about exactly this thing of like, well, I don't just want my artists to be reduced to a click to buy commodity. Um, how have you overcome that? Uh, so we were cognizant that that would be a concern from the beginning. So um, in terms of designing the site, it was a one of many, many factors. I mean, every choice that resulted in the experience that is platform now uh, was very considered. Um, and a lot um, of what we did to address those concerns, to keep the experience really um, immersive and beautiful and worthy of the amazing art and artists that are on platform. I mean, it was really about, you know, making sure that it's highly visual, making sure that we had the capacity to tell stories and to merchandise into kind of what are like little group shows on the site to do a lot of the things that actually both work in e-commerce. So like the little group shows that we put together are actually also an e-commerce tool, but they also help to contextualize the artworks. And so that satisfies both the customer and the gallery well, and the artists as well. Um, it really serves to you know, tell those stories that are so important to those creators and to show the works in the like, best visual way we thought possible. Right, so sort of using the both the, the tools of e-commerce and the the aesthetic or the the thoughtfulness of the art world and finding ways to unite them. Yeah, I mean it's one of the really great things also about um, you know platform is backed by a gallery and so we were able to um, collaborate and you know in fact David Werner was very much involved in the design of the site because he knows how to show art at its very best and so we were really merging my expertise in e-commerce with uh, the gallery's expertise in showing art and telling those stories and selecting great works. And, and we think it's, it's worked really well to um, really make sure that these objects are really easy to buy, but very special. Yeah, which is ultimately kind of the best of both worlds approach that I, we're hoping this actually ends up in if we, we pursue data in like a thoughtful way. Yeah. I want to move off slightly this idea of well, I guess let's stay in this territory of like potential downsides or pitfalls of the use of data. And when it comes to kind of the next phase of the art world, obviously there is a, a lot of discussion around um, correcting historical imbalances in a lot of ways. And one of the issues that any data scientist or anybody who's working with algorithms ends up running into is that there is a risk that if you're not very careful, 
what you can end up doing is perpetuating the same types of biases or blind spots or whatever that the old offline non-database traditional art world or industry um, was perpetuating for so long. So I, I'd rather talk about this in like specifics if we can. So I'm curious if any of you, any of you can offer a particular example of something that you've encountered in your own role where you've noticed that problem and found a way to work around it. I can take that one. Um, this is uh, this is something that's been a, a huge focus area uh, for Artsy, particularly over the last year or so. Um, I, I oftentimes say, if you're not careful, your your algorithm can misbehave. So that data is learning from what's happening in the real world. And so, if we look historically at the art world, you will see the true fact that the majority of sales are made by you know, white male artists. And how do, you, how do you combat that? How do you make sure that your machine is not just recommending more artists exactly like the artists that have been successful as the data tells the story uh, in years past? And so we've taken a lot of concrete steps to actually um, introduce more racial and gender diversity into our recommendations. We've taken a look and actually like tweaked the algorithm a bit. We have changed our onboarding. What well, I don't want to be too technical. We call it our onboarding flow. But if a new user joins Artsy, we'll ask them a series of questions to help understand their tastes and their taste profile. And we're intentionally serving up more BIPOC and female artists as part of that experience in order to try to get a broader input and surface a broader range of artists. Uh, we've also made changes to our recommendation engines as well, so that when the when the uh, site recommends, you know, if you like artist A, you may be interested in artist B, that we are surfacing up artist Bs that are, you know, a, a, a more uh, inclusive and diverse set of individuals. And I have to imagine that you're almost constantly tweaking that formula, just like, say, Facebook or Instagram is constantly tweaking their algorithm to serve you up theoretically the content that you're most interested in. Yeah, I mean it's an it's an ongoing kind of living project and we'll also pull in, you know, outside individuals as well because you might have your own internal biases within the corporation, within the organization that's actually looking at these algorithms. So we'll regularly have, you know, industry experts, curators, artists, gallerists come in and look at, you know, our our list of, for example, in-demand artists as the as the kind of algorithm is suggesting, just to make sure that we think, you know, there's a good balance of what I'd call art time science in terms of what's being recommend recommended. Right. And that's a, that's a tricky thing too because the part of the the perpetuation of bias problem is that it's not necessarily as if there are just people sitting there saying, yeah, I really want to downgrade all the women. Here's how I'm going to write this algorithm. It's just like it's an unconscious thing that happens, sometimes just because the data you're drawing from has happened to be heavily weighted towards men or whatever the, the case may be. So that has to be a, a difficult process. Yeah, it's, a, it's a nuanced approach for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing that I think is important to do um, and that we're trying to do at Platform um, and this is just a part of trying to make the art world and people who care about art a bigger community, but we tr try to engage underrepresented communities. We, you know, sell artwork and we work with influencers and things that hopefully bring people who are, you know, maybe less traditionally represented uh, from the buying side. Um, and then that also, you know, changes the data, changes like the interests that are represented in the data. Yeah, and, and out of curiosity, Bettina, like how much of the past data by this point, because Platform has been around now for what, almost a year? No, I mean, it, truthfully, we don't have enough data yet to be building algorithms, okay. nor do we, I, I actually believe that an algorithmic, recommendations engine for platform is probably not going to be something that we see soon even when we do have enough data to do that because it 
it's so important to us to be introducing our customers to what's really new and interesting. And almost by definition, there won't be data on that. But, um, but we've only actually been live to the world for about four months. Um, so we actually you know, are in early stages. All right. Well, this is just proof to everyone that the pandemic has completely melted my brain when it comes to time. So <laughs> apologies for that, Patina. <laughs> Tim, do you mind if I actually jump in? I know we don't face this too, no, too much, please. at least at ArtLogic, but something that I thought was interesting was how we addressed Armory Online, um, which is obviously the virtual accompaniment to this amazing in real life fair. And one thing I think that our team, as well as the Armory team, really considered was the Discover section that you see on the homepage. And it's really about a chance encounter. So I think the biggest thing that we did was ensure there, there was no algorithm. There's nothing there that's actually looking at anyone else, you know, what you're looking at and informing what you see in that section. It's actually random because we really wanted to mimic what is it like to actually walk into a fair and just be taken aback by a piece of work that you would never have confronted with. So it's that kind of thing. It's eliminating hierarchies, I think, where we can, um, and just trying to make it an evil ground and even playing field for everyone. That's interesting. One of the other, um, I guess, potential pitfalls when we're dealing with data and we're scaling up the amount of information that any company has on any of us. There's like this double-edged sword that, that ends up emerging where on the one hand, the more data any company has about you and what you like, the better the recommendations they can offer you, the better they can serve you, the better they can understand. To go back to your idea, Dustin, of, of like meeting customers where they're at, like you need to understand who those people are in order to be able to do that effectively. So that's one side. The other side Obviously, the more data any one company has about you, the more vulnerable it theoretically makes you if things go sideways, whether that's because the, in the most obvious example, you have hackers coming in and deciding that they want to exploit this data. Um, there is also the potential, and to be clear, not from anybody who is on the stage, but like there are unethical people who are out there who are collecting data, and sometimes they just use it for their own purposes that are not what we would like for them to be. So I guess my question is, I'm assuming that all three of you have to deal with this concern from your own perspective. And I would love to know sort of how you reassure people and what steps you take to try to make sure that the data security element is really sewn up as tight as it needs to be. I can kick that off. I mean, for us, since we are really the infrastructure that holds all of our clients' data, that's their proprietary information, we're the custodians of that. It's, it's not on us to look or touch that. It's really for us to ensure that the security and where it's being held is at the utmost. And I mean, that, that's changing all the time. Data protection regulations changing all the time. And just staying on top of that, knowing what the best practices are, continuing to future-proof your systems, I think is huge. So I think first and foremost, transparency. What systems do we work on? We're very open about that. We're more than happy to answer you know, where things are and all of that jazz. But um, yeah, I think that's really it. Yeah, I can, I can build on that. Um, so as a marketplace, uh, we need to protect both our buyers and our sellers. Um, and I think it's the responsibility of any player in the art world, you know, like ArtLogic, like Artsy, like Platform, where if you have this level of information, um, the onus is on that entity to protect its users. And for us, that's meant, you know, investments in um, cybersecurity, you know, bringing in teams of forensic consultants and cybersecurity experts to take a look at systems, processes, advise us on, you know, how to ensure that we are future-proofed and that you've built out these world-class uh, systems. And then ultimately, uh, again, as a marketplace, putting kind of your money where your mouth is. So introducing things like um, buyer and seller protections to make sure that people, that we've got our sellers back and our, and our buyers uh, backs as well. Um, yeah, I mean, very similar, I think, at Platform. I mean, we go through very, very long and involved, um, like months <laughs> of vetting any partner that we work with. For example, even Stripe, you know, a very, commonly used payment processor, we spent months <laughs> deciding on whether we felt comfortable with their security protocols and the way they encrypted data and things. And so um, 
Yeah, I, and we try to message that in our privacy policy. Um, we also um, have made it like very inconvenient for us to do some things that we would like to do, like have users subscribe to our newsletter because GDPR compliance means that you can't automatically subscribe them to your newsletter when they create an account any longer. So it just means putting extra steps in, in the process so that people have choices and, and, and know that users know that they have choices. I would also add that I don't think the onus is on users to be um, really, you know, really informed about security, but I, I would encourage users also, like being, for example, financially literate, to kind of just think about the companies and the business models behind the companies um, to which they're giving their personal data. Because, like, I mean, for example, I personally, um, outside of the art world, I, I use Google products mostly, but I know that they're selling my data because they make money, you know, by targeting ads and enabling ads. Um, whereas, like, I choose not to use Apple products because I just don't like them, but actually, like, that's, their business model doesn't rely on user data. So I think that those are interesting things that users can be thinking about, too, if they care about their privacy and, and their security of their data. Right, right. Uh, Dustin, were you going to add something, or did you just raise your mic because you were just... Yeah, I, I think you might read my mind. No, the only other thing I was just thinking is... Um, our industry is definitely attracting significantly more fraudulent activity uh, than years past because we are late to move online and because it is an industry that has generally been kind of more opaque and less regulated. So there are a lot of bad actors out there. And I think there is, um, you know, very much been kind of an awakening across the industry, and particularly with uh, most of our partners, our gallery partners, our auction houses, our fairs that we partner with, where there's, you know, something like phishing that you never even thought about, you know, a couple of years ago. You put up your website and we're promoting your works and everything was good, and now these scams have gotten so sophisticated, it is easier than one would think for people to hack into or get um, a gallery's, you know, login credentials, for example, or a user's login credentials. Um, so there's definitely important education that I think has to continue to happen across our industry. Right, and that, that ends up introducing another element, which is sort of, since you are the stewards of the data in that sense, it, like the onus kind of falls on you to do the educating of That's right. the customers. And like, how does that end up filtering into this picture? Like how much of your job is just like explaining to people <laughs> how this stuff works from a security standpoint? Quite a bit. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, aside from just, um, t you know, advising and telling our clients, you know, what we're doing and keeping abreast of everything as well, especially GDPR, AMLD5, um, anti-money laundry directive, what do you do with customer due diligence, all that kind of stuff. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought just there. <laughs> you do quite a lot of educating. Of we do. That's it. Thank you, Dustin. Yes, we do lo quite a lot of educating our clients because we have to. I mean, simple, simple things like get a password manager. Make sure you're not using the same password across multiple accounts, including our own. Um, make sure you put in two-factor authenticator. I mean, just building in these tools for them just to let them know that, yes, we are thinking about security. I mean, we're giving you the options to implement it. We advise that you do. Let's see. Well, let, let's go in this direction then. So I think that when the, the discussion turns to data more often than not, it tends to pivot really quickly to like marketplace specific things. We're talking about prices, we're talking about e-commerce, we're talking about sales. And that's only sort of the tip of the iceberg in actuality at this point. And I would love to just sort of expand the, the lens a little bit and ask each of you if you could just Talk about maybe one other type of data that you deal with that you think is important to what you do that the average person might not necessarily even think about when it comes to data in the art world. Serena, your enthusiastic nodding is am leading I, me to believe. <laughs> Um, well, one thing I think that's really interesting for us is in the past year, I mean, even in our sales, you've just seen an absolute increase in website sales and people going online 
And because of that, I mean, a lot of the data that we, we deal with is obviously proprietary. There's nothing we can do with that that's public. So what we've been looking at this year is actually what's in the public domain, what's being shared online, but also what's happening online, what's happening with web website inquiries, are people actually buying? And what we've actually seen, I think, which was reported in Claire McAndrews, our market report, was that I think 33% of sales were happening online in the first half of 2021. Um, and if we were to include art fairs, that's 37%. So it's not something that's going away by any means. And because we actually are able to look at this aggregated data, we can actually start to um, be informed and at least learn about certain trends that are happening, I think, across the industry based on what they're actually doing online. I, can I actually back up and just comment sure. about one thing in the question? Yes. So the question <laughs> like starts with um, kind of challenging the idea that like price should be like the focal point of art data. And yeah, it's only one data point. There are other things to be looking at, but there isn't enough price transparency either yet. So I just want to say that first, is there's still a long way to go there. Mm -hmm. um, but also uh, just to, to answer the rest of your question, how else do we use data? I think that we you know, are doing some fun stuff in that you know, at Platform, we're trying to get people who haven't bought art before to be interested in art and then go ahead and buy it. And there's a lot, you know, we have a lot of hypotheses on how that new collector or person who is not a collector yet thinks about art and how their behaviors and attitudes are different than a more seasoned collector. And so you can even do some testing on platforms like Instagram and like, you know, from you know, the captions and the like type of content that you put out there, you know, whether it's something that like humanizes the artist and if that resonates more versus something that, you know, really features artwork first, all of that provides really great insight into what a new generation is interested in and how they think about art. And I think that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big plus one on price transparency. It's surprising to me, it's still the number one pain point uh, and the number one ask from our users is they're, they're incredibly frustrated if they show up to a marketplace and can't see the price point or at least a price range of what they want to buy. And then similarly, galleries will get frustrated when some of the leads that they're getting are just people inquiring about price. And it's like, look, oh, just break down that last wall. It's not the worst thing in the world. Just price, price, price. Um, but in terms of additional data that I think is interesting um, and that we look at and use and I think it benefits both buyers and sellers is just the, the customer behaviors. So who is the, you know, the artsy user? Who are they following? Who do they like? Who are they inquiring about? Who are they bidding on in auction? Who have they purchased in the past? How has that changed over time? And then from there, you can start matching, you know, supply and demand in a more in a more sophisticated way. And you wouldn't be able to do that and do that at, at scale without having rich sets of, of data. And ultimately, it helps the sellers to sell more, but also helps the you know the collector or the you know new collector discover more uh, and discover more artists that they might not have otherwise. Just to go back to the, the price transparency issue a little bit, I mean, Bettina, as somebody who came into the, the arts use of e-commerce from outside, how surprised were you? Did you know what you were getting into in terms of like coming into this and the idea that you were going to offer everything at a set shown price? Did you think that there, this was going to be easier than it was? Like, if you had people that you've dealt with in platform, who were just like, look, I'd love to participate, but I don't want my artist prices to be out there. My artist doesn't want their prices to be out there. Um, I'll answer the last question first. I mean, so far, actually, we haven't had resistance from the galleries that we've invited to be on platform, but they certainly, galleries that are resistant exist. I think it's just that, you know, we do a lot of research before we invite galleries on to the site and we're looking for galleries that are very like-minded and so you know there's some filtering that way but I actually my my first job was at Christie's and then I left for business school and then I spent 10 years in e-commerce so I, I very much knew what kind of a traditional art world attitude was and what the art world 
you know, kind of like resources were. And um, so I, I knew how hard it would be, but that's also part of what was very exciting to me in uh, launching platform and being able to do something that is for the industry pretty bold. Right. I want to pivot to actually back to something that we sort of nodded to a little bit earlier in terms of the idea of having all these different types of data, but in some sense, they're, they're still siloed in their own respective places. So like, each one of you is working at a different company that has different data on different people. And there is one argument out there that says, well, the way that this really moves forward is when those companies with those different types of data start coming together and working together and building kind of collaborative uses for that data. And Serena, since ArtLogic and Artsy already work together in that capacity, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about sort of the validity of that that argument, if you think there are limits to it, and how it's worked so far, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, between um, Artsy and ArtLogic, it was a really natural integration, I think, for us. We have a lot of mutual clients that had literally come asking both of us, how can we share our artwork between both platforms. So that was really kind of a natural evolution for us. And then when we actually started embarking on this, we started to realize, I think, the power of that integration and how beneficial it was for the user's experience. And again, looking at another industry's um, integration, collaboration with other organizations, playing your strengths, you know, we're not going to build e-commerce, we're going to go to Stripe, they know how to build e-commerce, I think is really important. And um, yeah. Yeah, I would just add that when thinking about an integration, um, it's important to back to kind of meeting your customer where they are. Our joint gallery partners were basically saying to us, you know, it's too difficult. I'm spending too much time or I'm having to hire staff to move data around from like one product to another product, one platform to another platform. That's not what most gallerists got in the business to do, right? They want to be able to focus on what they love, which is identifying talent and developing artists' careers. And so to the extent that we can help our, our partners do what they do best and you know take away some of this like back office type of work um i think it's just it's in everyone's best interest mm -hmm. is there is there a counter argument to that is there anybody who at least thinks that there's there's a prospect that maybe this isn't always the best thing it's okay if the answer is no i mean you could get Sorry, you were going to talk, so I'll make... I, I saw but you know was whining like up. Thorn. She was like, up the mic. <laughs> um, I do think that there... So people have mentioned Stripe a couple of times, for, uh, which is a, a payment processor. Um, you can... If you're not careful, you do need to think about just overarching business risk if you become overly reliant on one single partner. So if a Stripe goes down, does your entire e-commerce capability go down? Or do you have backup options? Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind for me is just be cognizant of, you know, as you are selecting other partners and integrating, you know, your own infrastructure, be cautious of whether or not you kind of have a single point of failure in your in your business. Options are always important. People love options. <laughs> Different take on your question. Um, <laughs> I um, I think that there are people who feel as though merging data sets is just like going to give everyone more information and that is a good thing. But every data set is created with some intention behind it. There's no objective data set. And so um, you just have to be very thoughtful and strategic if you are going to enter into a partnership, like I'm sure you guys are being thoughtful and strategic about this exact thing. But um, I'll, I'll give an example from a past life as well. I um, my first e-commerce job was at a company called Quidzy, which was acquired by Amazon. And Quidzy was selling um, like things that parents would need, high and high income parents. And um, so also was able to access data from Amazon, um, whose customer tends to have more of an eye towards like the price point and less towards like paying a premium for convenience. And so we found in 
a lot of cases that like the intention that you would see in the same customer shopping on Amazon versus at a Quidzy site was pretty different. And so like one could make the mistake of like looking at the customer's behavior on Amazon and thinking that that's what they would see at Quidzy. But you have to just have a more nuanced perspective and it takes time and it takes thoughtfulness. So it's not just about like taking two data sets and like giant, you know, like data poles and, and combining them. You, you just can't do that. Right, yeah, it goes back to the, the importance of sort of what you're collecting, how you're collecting it, uh, what the background on that data is. I mean, we even see this in, this is a part of the reason why, to go a little further afield, like this is why polling data is sometimes not necessarily very trustworthy because if you ask the question in like a loaded way, it can end up distorting the results. So yeah, it's like there's all these second level things again that are happening behind the scenes. It's also not easy to combine data sets. Like it sounds simple, but it was a ton of work to get our data to be able to, to you know, speak with one another uh, seamlessly. So it's also like, it's not this cheap and easy thing for all these various providers to just go gobble up all these different data sets. It's, it's a lot of um, technical work. Yeah, I mean, out of curiosity, how long did it take you to actually fully merge those two data sets roughly? Yeah, I was going to say a couple quarters of like, we also like were kind of working on it like steady burn in the background. I think if we had, you know, put all of our collective engineers on it, we could have gotten it done pretty quickly. But we probably started talking about it a year ahead of when it actually launched and definitely took a couple of quarters of solid development time. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the flashing clock at my feet here, and I want to leave some time at the end for, uh, for the audience to be able to ask questions. So why don't we end on this? I would love to hear from each of you, given where we are right now, like what you think the next evolutionary phase of the art world's use of data looks like, and what we need to do in order to actually get there. My response is kind of boring because like I think that <laughs> I think the immediate next step for platform kind of represents a next step for the art world which is really understanding how you like the behaviors and what interests a person who's new to buying art like what actually hooks them and gets them to to buy and that requires a lot of like the exact work that we're doing like testing like different ways of selling and selling different you know the, like kinds of art that we think you know a newer person will be interested in and, you know, like measuring all sorts of, you know, ways that they interact with our site once they get there. Um, so it is kind of a boring question because it is like the work that I do. But one thing I'll throw in there that's not work that I do that I think actually never gets talked about is logistics. I think there's so much that's happening right now in the world of art logistics that um, is going to, um, you know, if you ever were to look at what happens behind the scenes, they have to do so much work to... Uh, you know, provide shipping rates, and that all involves data, and to provide that accurately and instantaneously is like crazy hard work. Um, and, and there are leaps going on there that are really impressive. So I think that's also the future. Yeah, as somebody who for a time worked in a gallery and was responsible for collecting estimates for packing and shipping, and let me just say, the sooner we can turn that over to the robots, the better off <laughs> the people working in galleries will be. Yeah. Uh, you kind of stole a little bit of my answer. We're working on that. Sorry. <laughs> no, but I would say, um, I think in many respects it is staying, like more of the same in terms of continuing to get um, shift behaviors, continue to get more transparency, more data in place, but then importantly, making the buying experience, making the transaction itself as easy and simple as possible. So from somebody seeing a work, falling in love with it, to having it in their home and on their wall, just that whole entire process being as easy as, you know, we've come to expect in our, in our lives, and particularly younger collectors have come to expect having grown up in the age of the internet. So I think you'll see a lot more um, in terms of e-commerce and fulfillment uh, and kind of like 
that being a smoother, easier process. And then I also think longer run, you know, sometimes I think about the stock market and you, you can have standing indications of interest. If you're interested in, in buying, um, you know, perhaps it's a, 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 a private sale and, you know, the, you can't just easily buy stock, right? You can have a standing indication of interest to buy or you can have a standing indication of interest to sell. I think it would be really cool to see the art market actually get to a place where you could have a standing indication of I'm interested in these types of artists, I'm interested in these price points, and have that in you know a more automated fashion. I think that's farther down the line. Let's get the let's get the works onto people's walls with ease first. But um, I do think you'll see kind of a Nasdaq for art at some point. Interesting. Well, get, getting those works on the walls, I think a huge development, at least trying to bridge you know, the digital space and the physical and how those really accompany each other is gonna be development and augmented in virtual reality. And I think we're already starting to see that a lot in commercial sectors. We're ourselves trying to build AR features in our own websites and viewing rooms. So it's gonna be really, I mean, we don't even understand or probably can even fathom where that's gonna go, but I think that that's gonna be, I mean, people are talking about a metaverse. So yes, there's a lot to, to unpack and think about um, in the near and far off future there. Yeah, the, plenty of uh, interesting things to come, I think. So we will leave it there, and I will pivot out to the audience. Does anybody have any questions for anybody? Yes, sir. So I come from the finance side of things, so not very knowledgeable on art, but um, I've met a lot of people over the years that have been um, had a lot of keen interest in art, especially as an investment, um, as investments, right? But it's often been very tough because of the transparency or just like lack of knowledge of some of these artists or pieces that whether it seems like now with data becoming better um you know i even hear of platforms that you can um together pool money with various investors and buy you know pieces and um i believe now like said you know like you know the platform the website seems like it's providing various tools various arts with prices so what do you guys see in this space do you think it's a um, a lot of people coming in, especially people that don't buy it as a hobby per se, but just as pure as an investment too. It's like, I want to diversify my holdings. You know, it's not correlated to much stocks or bonds. You know, what do you guys see in, in that place? Is there more, more interest or, you know, what tools are out there for people that have an interest in that area? I can kick us off. Um, I think I talk to so many people that say, I love art, but I don't even know where to begin. I, I'm terrified to even ask for pricing, and then I don't understand if the pricing that I get is you know, relevant or good or not. And it's not that they're necessarily even wanting to view art as an investment category, but it's like they just don't even feel like they're armed with the right information to even step into the space. Um, and I think that as we, I, well, first, I think that's part of the reason why um, there are studies out there that show uh, only 90, oh, there are 98% of uh, people that have over a million dollars in assets that do not collect art. And part of that is, again, this just, they're buying tons of other luxury items. They have no problem spending on jewelry, watches, yachts, you know, you name it. But art feels like just too opaque and too, it's too much of a conundrum. So I think in what we're seeing is as more information is available, as it's easier to do the research like you would on any other asset class, you do see more new buyers coming to the space. Um, we've certainly seen that at Artsy and we've seen even over the last, the course of the last year, um, our galleries reported that 70% of their online purchases over the course of the last year were coming from new buyers. And so they've got their repeat purchases, you know, coming in to the gallery, for example, but a lot of times it's new buyers that they're reaching online. And I think that is partly driven by the fact that information is finally available and somebody can do that research and decide, you know what, I love this work and I actually can see that I think it's worth this amount and I'm interested in this artist's career and background and I'm gonna go ahead and make that, make that purchase. I would say that, um, and actually we have a, a piece of content that we're publishing in two weeks about this very topic, so I would encourage you to read it. Um, but um, I, if you want to invest in art in a way that's fairly kind of predictable and date-oriented, 
you kind of have to be ultra wealthy and invest in blue chip art. <laughs> you know, that has been sold and resold and where there's a decent amount of data and also where there's like some predicta predictable amount of liquidity. But, you know, blue chip art is, is expensive and it's rare by definition. So if you want to invest in art in a different sense, in a less kind of like ROI focused way, um, particularly on primary market artworks, um, then you're really, I think, looking for downside protection. You want to know that you're spending your thousands of dollars well um, on a piece of art by an artist who's going to have a career that has um, growth potential and you know where you can hopefully maybe one day resell it if you'd like to um, and so those are the kinds of factors that we look for when we um, some of the factors that we look for when we're selecting art for platform they're like we're not saying that we are you know selling you investment worthy art but these are artists who do have that growth potential and I think that that gives someone who's fairly new to buying art comfort in what they're buying but it's not about ROI in our opinion I love how the gentleman with finance was thinking about masterworks. <laughs> I'm in marketing. Um, I'm, you talk a lot about source of growth and new prospects. I'm curious, what have you found as the most successful or surprising new tactics to source those new buyers or collectors? And have you found it worth the investment or efforts to do so? Um. Hmm. I don't know if I can think of anything that's too surprising just yet. I don't know if you yeah, are. I, mean, I would say a lot <laughs> of, we are seeing, this is not surprising, but a lot of discovery will happen on social media. So there's a you know heavy use of Instagram in particular where someone will, you know, start following an artist and then from there we see them come to artsy to learn more about that artist to do more research and then ultimately to to make a purchase um, but again i don't think that is necessarily a huge surprise um, but we do see a bigger differential there between younger collectors versus more established collectors younger collectors are absolutely starting on social media platforms or going directly to you know, marketplaces like Artsy versus uh, established collectors that are more comfortable with reaching out to their advisor, going to the gallery directly, et cetera. As for the question though about whether it's worth the investment though, I think inevitably yes. I mean the art market is, a, you know, I don't know what the most recent estimate of the size of the market is, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I mean, other luxury markets are multiples larger. And I think that it is one way of thinking about how much larger the art market could be if there were more people coming into it. So absolutely, I think it's worth the investment. Yeah, and also just, I will add that the, the whole idea of reaching out to new buyers, people you didn't know before, uh, that's, that's not a a mission that's specific just to people who are working with data, like that's the reason art fairs exist, for instance. I mean, this is something that dealers have been trying to do, and auction houses have been trying to do for a very long time, and it's just that now they're, I think they're doing it in a more sophisticated way than they used to be doing it. One thing I will say we have noticed is um, the next generation of collector is very, uh, they are very passionate and thoughtful about how they spend their money. And so we do see a lot that come through via charity or benefit uh, causes in particular. And then from there, kind of get the, get the bug and start collecting. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Okay, we've got 20 seconds left on this clock. I am going to say that that is close enough to the proper ending time for us to just leave it there. Thank you to everyone up here. Thanks to you in the audience. And have a great rest of your Sunday.